uh, Elsa away tonight up in Brisbane. But uh, anyway, we'll have a look at some scriptures and we'll go from there. All right. So uh, I've got a strange title on tonight's talk. It's, uh, it's called Naked. Okay, that got your attention, didn't it? Well, almost. Anyway, um, uh, there are times when um, being naked are acceptable, of course, which is uh, perhaps when you're having a shower or taking a bath. That's all okay. But uh, if you were to be naked while you were down at Woolies doing the shopping, you'd probably get arrested and taken away, no doubt. Um, so that wouldn't be right. But, um, but in the Bible, um, a general rule of thumb is when uh, people were naked in the Bible. It meant, generally meant that there was somebody that they were exposing all of one's flesh and uh, it was usually not good. And, uh, and exposing one's flesh symbolises sin or going into error in the Bible. So uh, when people ended up in, uh, naked before God in that aspect, then they ended up in error before God. And that's the way God saw it. So, um, uh, and God was... Um, uh, if you're going to come before God, you've got to come before him uh, covered in some way. And, um, uh, you know, when, they, when the garment was made for the high priest, every part of his flesh had to be covered uh, when he went into the inner chamber to uh, go before the Lord, to make atonement for the people once a year. They had to wear all this gear. There could be no flesh exposed. Uh, otherwise, it was, it was a death sentence. That would be the end of you. So uh, the Lord had it all set up from the very start. But at the very start... Uh, there was no sin, everything was going great guns and we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2 and uh, verse 23. In the beginning it was fine, we have Adam and Eve here and Adam said, uh, this is now bone of uh, my bones and flesh of my flesh and she shall be called woman uh, for she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and uh, they shall be one flesh and they were both naked, the man and his wife and were not ashamed. So there was no problem at the start, at the beginning of this. They hadn't really gone into error. Uh, there were no problems. So just they were in complete communication with the Lord. And there was no uh, no issues at all. And uh, here they were. You might notice in verse forty five, in verse uh, twenty four, there it said he cleaved unto his wife. He didn't cleave unto his partner, his girlfriend. The cleaving happened after there was the God approved wife was there. So. Uh, Something to take on, good wording here by in scripture, but uh, he cleaved unto his wife. So after it was official that that was his partner, of course. Not that he had many choices. I don't think there was many girls lined up, but still, that's the way God always had it worked out, wasn't it? That's where he wanted it. So, um, but they lost their innocence, didn't they? Uh, they were there in the garden and, um, and then they went into error. And we're going to look at that in chapter 3 and verse 7. Um, uh, they had eaten of the wrong fruit. Uh, God told them not to eat from it. There was only one instruction. Don't eat from that fruit. Uh, don't eat that one. Uh, you'll, you'll go into error if you take that fruit. And of course they did that. And uh, in verse 7 of Genesis 3, and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So straight away they, their flesh was exposed in their error and straight away they knew they were naked. They weren't worried about it before, but now they're worried about it. Now they're worried about turning up before God with no covering, see, no clothes on. And they knew they were naked, so they hid. And uh, they grabbed some fig leaves, uh, put them together and made some aprons for themselves. Um, trouble is, the fig leaves were never going to cover them properly. Uh, that was never going to work. We're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, that's man's way of covering the shame and the nakedness. He throws some fig leaves together and hopes for the best, but you can never cover it. It never works uh, and it didn't work for them either. And they heard, verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord uh, God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So straight away, of course, the Lord knew that they'd, because they knew. And so everybody knew they had 
made a mistake and uh, gone into error and gone against what God said. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So poor old Adam, <laughs> she said, the woman made me do it. And uh, it's been man's downfall ever since, hasn't it? But anyway, besides that, there he was in problems and, uh, and, and, and they felt shame before the Lord and they knew that they were naked. In verse 21 of that chapter, uh, it tells you how the covering was meant to be. It said, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And um, so the very third chapter in Genesis, God's explaining how things are done. God does the covering. Um, but the trouble was, and they're covered with skins, so somebody had to die. An animal had to die. Blood shed had to be blood had to be shed to get the skins uh, to cover their shame, their nakedness, their sin. So sound familiar? Someone has to die to cover your sin. So there had to be blood spilt to cover this problem. Then God took care of that, and God's always taken care of that. Man's efforts is to cover sin is to sew some fig leaves together, or do this, or do that, or whatever. But it's never going to work unless God does the covering. So we're going to fast forward um, a few, quite a few hundred years. We'll go to Exodus 32 and uh, we're going to see what's happening here. And uh, this was uh, <clears throat> Moses had gone up into the mount to collect the Ten Commandments. He'd be gone some time. Uh, people didn't know where on earth he'd, uh, he'd ended up and uh, they were getting restless and didn't know what they were doing. But anyway, Moses was there in charge, more or less. And um, he comes back from the mount, verse 21 of Exodus 32. And Moses said unto Aaron, uh, what, did this people, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Uh, of course, they all threw in some gold and they built the golden calf and they worshipped the golden calf. And Aaron said, uh, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot that thou knowest the people, they are set on mischief. They're just, they're just bent on doing the wrong thing. Mischiefy people, you know, it's, it seems to be easier to do evil than it does to be good for some reason. And uh, things really haven't changed that much, really. For they said unto me, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land in Egypt, we not what uh, is become of him. So they had zero patience as well couldn't wait for him to come back and I said unto them uh, whosoever hath any gold let them break it off so they gave it to me and I cast it into the fire and there, and there came out this calf this calf just popped out after he threw some gold in the fire it was a miracle uh, but obviously a bit more work went into it than that and um, this calf came out and uh, they're worshipping a golden calf and then Moses stood in the gate of the camp Oh, sorry, verse 25, Mr. Verse. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, and Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So Levi, the priestly tribe, they kind of had it together. They thought, we're, we're going to, you were going into Moses' camp. We're heading over there. And, and it's either God's side or it's the other side. They're the two choices. You're going to be on the camp that's clothed or on the camp that's naked uh, and uncovered and shameless and shamed before God. They're the two choices. There's only ever been two choices. It's saved or not saved, in or out. Uh, in the ark, you got saved. Out of the ark, you drowned. And that's the process and it's always been the same. You're either spirit-filled or you're not spirit-filled as well. So here they were naked, um, and uh, uncovered before the Lord. And um, verse 27. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbour. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today, to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow 
uh, that Moses said unto the people, you've sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. So we see the setting up of the making atonement for sin, and, uh, and Moses who went up there to do that for the Lord, to say, you know, sorry for the people, Lord, and make an atonement, which is what the high priest did for the nation of Israel. Every year he would go in and make an atonement for the sins of the people. And uh, just to get that uh, uh, the connection back that they needed to have. The word atonement in the Strong's Concordance, it's actually a verb, so it's a doing word. It's, uh, atonement is an action word. It's not just something that happens. Action has to happen for atonement to take place. And it means to cover. So when they're not at one with God, then they're naked before God and they're in shame before God. But when they're at one with God, at one moment or atonement, you've got a covering. So you're now covered and your nakedness is not bare before the Lord. Um, it actually says to cover specifically with bitumen in your concordance, which is, which is, um, I thought was uh, strange. Well, not strange. It's probably obvious. But remember they, the ark that saved the people, they covered it within and without with bitumen, with pitch. And they covered it and it floated above the problems of the world and it and uh, it saved it so the covering made everything possible uh, perhaps without that bitumen coating on the ark it would have just sunk with the rest of the world but they it was covered it also means to uh, uh, placate or to cancel something out it means to appease these are other english words for this same um, strong's word the, for atonement it's a hebrew word uh, uh, kofa and it also means to cleanse, to disannul, to forgive, to be merciful, to pacify, to pardon, to purge away, to put something off, and to reconcile, to reconciliation. So all of those English words are used in the Bible for that same Hebrew word, wherever they think the English word fits best for it, um, obviously, with the translators when they put it in. Uh, Brown's Driver Briggs comes up with the same thing. That's another, uh, they have their own definitions on some of these words. And they literally, it's pretty much everything's covered. There's like eight examples. It means to cover, purge, make an atonement, make reconciliation, cover over with pitch. They came to the same conclusions. To coat something over or to cover it with pitch. To cover over, to pacify, to cover over, atone for sin. To cover over, atone for sin and persons by legal rights. Um, to be covered over. It just goes on and on and on. And it's just telling us that you can't, go before God naked and expose all of the flesh. God doesn't work that way. The flesh, we're born in sin and we're shaped in iniquity, the Bible says. So we're doomed from the start. We, we're born alive to die, sadly, because that's the world we, we come into. And God's got to cover us with his special covering to make it right so that we float above the problems of the world like the ark did when it was covered. Um... When man tries to do it, the covering never works, of course. His, his ways never work. Of course, um, <clears throat> once again, all of this set the scene where Moses had to go up and or the process that was going to happen for hundreds of years more as the Lord covered people and their nakedness and their shame before him. Okay, 2 Chronicles 28. There's a, a metaphor here of being naked from the whole um, Judah, the whole southern kingdom had gone naked before the Lord because of a king. Just one verse here, 2 Chronicles 28, 19. For the Lord brought Judah's, Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked and transgressed a sore against the Lord. So they really did the wrong thing by God, uh, badly did the wrong thing by God. Uh, the king incited that. He should have been leading the people, but he did the wrong thing too. He got it, got it all wrong. And Jacob, uh, Judas, uh, they weren't naked, literally, but they were in shame before God, metaphorically. And so the whole place, they were just completely bare before the Lord and gone completely wrong. Uh, they really needed God's grace and mercy to cover them somehow, some way. And... Um, and uh, we're going to have a look at that uh, very soon. But we'll go to 2 Corinthians first in chapter 5. 
So we'll bring it up into the New Testament. There's a myriad of scriptures that we can talk about, and I'd only have a few minutes. <clears throat> but 2 Corinthians 5, to bring it into the New Testament, <clears throat> talking about God's covering, like he did Adam and Eve, he covered them with uh, skins, and uh, he does the covering, he makes the atonement every time, the Lord decides that, yes, I'll cover that and, um, and uh, take away the shame and the nakedness. Um, 2, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon uh, with our house which is from heaven. If so be that we... That be, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found and naked. For we are uh, that are in his tabernacle to groan, being burdened, not for that we would not be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So Paul's talking about the same stuff. He's talking about we've got to be clothed. We don't want to be found naked before the Lord. We, we really want to have this clothing that God, only God can put on us and to, uh, and to, um, and to keep us um, as we go on. And there was a whole bunch of other scriptures in there, but I didn't have time to bring those out. But really fast forwarding to the book of Revelation and really fast forwarding, um, we get to the point where um, uh, the Lord's coming back and he's telling everyone to be watching and keeping our garments well, keeping them on, really, and uh, not getting them spotted by the flesh, and more importantly, keeping them where they're supposed to be. Um, in Revelation 16, verse 15, it said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And uh, metaphorically, once again, but um, that's what happens. When you expose too much of the flesh in your life, or well, you really just not covered anymore before God. Just like Adam and Eve knew they weren't covered. And I think intrinsically we know when we're not covered properly before the Lord. We know when we're not walking in the Lord. We know when we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. We, the Spirit will tell us. It will hit us over the head pretty, pretty hard. Uh, you generally feel fairly convicted when you go down the wrong path. And that's God's warning device for us to help us. And uh, the idea is that we take notice of that and go back on track and make sure that we don't appear before God naked in any form or fashion. And um, that's the warning in Revelation. He's going to come and uh, be watching and keeping your garments, making sure you're right before the Lord. Revelation 3, um, the lazy church was naked, but they didn't even know they were. They didn't even realise it. And um, we're going to look at that little story in verse 14 of Revelation 3. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert either cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy sh the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And there's a few ways you can look at the Laodicean church. Um, I mean, generally, we apply it to a spirit-filled church, but you could apply it equally to a church that's really not spirit-filled, but, but serving God in the best of their ability, doing things, saying they love God and doing things for God, that's, that's all well and good. But if, um, 
you know, you, if you've got no white raiment, well, you're not even spirit-filled. You haven't got there yet. So, uh, you know, and the Lord, he, he obviously looks at people because, uh, you know, there's plenty of good people in the world and plenty of good churches, but uh, God always gives people the opportunity to hear the truth, to hear the gospel, the opportunity to be spirit-filled and to be clothed by God. Because if you're not clothed by God, you're still naked before him. And, uh, and uh, in this day and age, uh, where we need to be born again, we heard it in testimony, and be clothed with that right raiment. Uh, that comes with the born again experience, I believe. And um, this could be talking about a church that's lost their way, that were spirit filled. It could be a church talking about a church that's not even spirit filled, but it's a great church with great people in it that love God. And they do exist, we know they exist. I mean, it's just our job to say, well, there's more. Just like Paul came across the guys in Acts 19, he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Oh, we haven't heard about it. Well, they, they had their ears open and they were listening and they thought, yeah, we'll, have a, we'll, tr we'll try that. And of course, he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. That's what needs to be done. That's what has to be done to all of these, to, to these things, whether it's a spirit-filled church or a not spirit-filled church. The process is the same for everybody. You've got to be able to go through there and be covered uh, by the Lord at the end of the day. Okay, Hebrews chapter 4 to finish on, and verse 14. And it is a state state of affairs when you think you're clothed before God and you're actually not because you said you know, they didn't know they were. You know, this was a church that didn't know they were naked. So it's a pretty tricky one and it's, a, it's, a, it's a one to remind us all that we should be uh, vigilant and be watching because the Lord's coming. Okay, uh, Hebrews 4 verse 14. Mm. Uh, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly uh, unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find a grace to help in the time of need. So, uh, of course, Jesus came and he's the great high priest and uh, he's made it. He rose from the dead in a new body. He was flesh, and then he rose in a body that wasn't flesh and uh, internal in the heavens with his father, and he's promised that for all of his followers too, to go through and through the same process into the heavens and uh, the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Now, the mercy seat in the uh, uh, Old Testament, in the Hebrew, uh, was... A mercy seat was a, had the cherubims over the Ark of the Covenant and it was literally a lid on the covenant. It was a covering for the Ark because inside the Ark was the Aaron's fruit, uh, the rod that budded. There was uh, uh, the commandments of God. There was the bread and the manna. Uh, that was all in there. And where, where technically, metaphorically, where the Ark and where we've, we've got the word of God in us and we've got the fruit that's budding in us of the Spirit, and where that ark, the testimony of the ark, you've read it in scripture, and we maintain a testimony at the same time. We do all of these things, but the mercy seat was a lid on the top and it, and it, and it covered the ark. It covered everything inside. So the mercy seat was literally a covering and the mercy seat was also the place of atonement because once a year that high priest would go in there and he would sprinkle blood over the mercy seat seven times, very symbolic, seven times for the cleansing process. Like uh, uh, the leper had to go wash in the Jordan seven times to get clean. They knew the processes. They knew how it worked before God. And he would go in and, seven and uh, sprinkle the seat seven times, one day of the year on the Day of Atonement, uh, symbolically reconciling God and his people together and bringing them back into one place again and um, basically making atonement, covering all of their sin, covering all of their shame, the whole nation um, getting back on track, all ready to go for another year <laughs> just to do it all again a year later because we're pretty hopeless. Mankind's hopeless. He just falls back 
into sin. He's pretty good at not being covered and pretty good at being shameful before the Lord. But God's got the lid on it and it's only through his mercy that we can come boldly before him through grace and mercy to the throne because God's covered everything for us. He's covered us, he's given us a garment, he's dressed us and he's got it all sorted out so that we can come before him without shame and, uh, and be fully atoned before him and be with him. Back in the garden one day, as the Bible tells us, being reconciled, back in God's presence, um, once again walking and talking with the Lord forever, where we need to be. So uh, there we go. All right.